You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packer Night Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. So today on this day in history, we're looking at one year ago, and I don't really know how else to describe it other than I felt the need to take a break from, you know, all the looking back at statistics and everything else and just kind of touch on a bunch of different things and give opinions and rant and rave. And so if you like my ranty, ravey podcast, this one might be for you. But anyways, we will take a break, get into that. For the rest of you, I will talk to you tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have. Because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop. That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal, independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. So today, um, I'm not doing the defensive stuff. We've got an early dance party. Welcome to the show. Uh, we're not going to be doing the uh, defensive stuff and stuff. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of a break from that, but I am working on it. I feel like doing that stuff kind of gets monotonous after a while, like reading statistics. So you got to break it up a little bit. It's interesting, but you don't want to do too many consecutive days of that stuff. I don't want to do the work consecutive days, and I don't want to sit here and bore myself and bore all of you with... And not, not that it's boring, it's interesting stuff, but after a while it just starts to feel like reading numbers. Just got to break it up a little bit. That's all I'm saying. So today I want to talk about a couple of free agent things. Obviously, there was the uh, Twitter firestorm over Cole Beasley tweeting eye emojis, which apparently to a lot of people means something. I don't know what it means, but it means something. So I want to look at that and whether or not we should do it, in my opinion, maybe help you fortify your own opinion on that. I was asked by Matt on Twitter about Vic Beasley, so we got uh, two Beasleys to talk about today. So I want to look into that a little bit and see if maybe that would be an option or what the situation is with him. And I also want to weigh in on uh, the uh, Anthony Barr situation because everybody seems to be doing that for some reason. I don't know, man. You know how I am about things blowing up on the Twitters. I get unnecessarily annoyed by it. I don't really know why feel like people are talking about it simply because people are talking about it but it's something to talk about so I'll just give my two cents on it because it's I mean it is an interesting question but to have that definitive of, of an opinion is kind of difficult because well we'll save that but I, I yeah I don't know it's just confusing I think people just hear things and get all excited about stuff I don't know whatever 
I'm not a shrink. I, you know, people can deal with their own. I got my own stuff. People can deal with their stuff. Um, I want to weigh in on the overtime discussion, not because it matters, because the NFL doesn't care what we think, but um, I do have an opinion on that, so I figured I'd let you know what it is and why it is. And I'm kind of glad I waited on it. I actually kept forgetting I wanted to talk about it, and I keep talking about other stuff and forgetting this one, which is the big I talked about, like, the rules, which, I mean, whatever. The rules are annoying just because you can't fix it, but it is unbelievably horrible when things go wrong. And it's so nuanced. Like I said, you know, with there's always a penalty on every play. So when do you throw a flag? When do you not? And then you see him actually throw a flag on a ticky tack thing. And it's like, well, why'd you do that? But then if you don't do that, it's like, well, you should have because it was a penalty and it's a big moment. And they're always going to miss stuff. And yeah, there's, there's just nothing you can do. And again, you go back to computers and New York making phone calls to throw flags on the field. And then you really start to make this a horrible sport because there's flags every play. And then you try to build algorithms to say, well, don't either don't call these plays that are ticky tack, which then it's never going to call like a, a sort of general hold because there's always holding, seemingly always holding. Or you just build in the algorithm where it misses every once in a while. But if you're going to do that, then you might as well just have human beings doing the job again because sometimes they miss stuff. Might as well just let it happen naturally. You can't fix it is the point. And I, you know, as much as I might as well just launch into something, well, we'll talk about rules because I wasn't planning on talking about it anyways. As much as I am all in favor of, um, you know, instant replay and trying to fix it, This is like everything else in life. The more it seems like we try to fix things on a macro scale, we try to fix things on a macro scale that involve a giant group of people, we always make it worse. It never, it always exacerbates the, and it feels like it shouldn't. Like, here's a problem. Here's something we can do to fix the problem. And it just makes everything worse. Every single time we try to fix something, it makes it worse. Lesson being... You got to just let it go, man. You got to just let it be. We can't go back and give the Saints a win. You just can't do that because they didn't win. They should have won, but they didn't win. They didn't win because a referee made a mistake. And as much as I hate it, the referees are a part of the game. I don't want referees to be a part of the game. I want coaches and GMs and players. I want everybody that impacts a football team and the two football teams to be a part of it. I don't want any of the extra stuff to ever be a part of the game. I don't want, well, you, but he, okay, here's something. What about the fans? You got crowd noise. That's a part of the game. That's external. So there's that. You got the weather. That's sort of external. Granted, it impacts both teams, but, you know, some teams may be a little more acclimated, right? Packers don't want to go to, you know, Miami in August or September. And, uh, you know, the the Houston Texans don't want to go to Green Bay in December. It's not fair that there are teams on the West Coast who have to go to New York when, you know, the whatever. I guess the point is there are external unfair things that are built in. Some stadiums are built with crowd noise. You got, you know, Chicago now has that horrific air raid thing. Minnesota has that horn, which is actually kind of cool. I kind of like it as much as I'm not supposed to because I'm a Packers fan. That thing is awesome. There, I said it, all right? It's awesome. That thing is, like, ominous and horrifying and awesome. It gets me jacked up. I mean, I hate it, but, I mean, if that was, like, my thing, that would get me jacked up. The Bears thing is just dumb. It's just a loud, annoying sound. But they have it. Some The stadiums that get built build them so that crowd noise is really, really loud and actually gives them an unfair advantage at home. Something that, you know, the Green Bay Packers don't have. It almost makes me want to just build a dome on the thing, even though Packer fans don't have any clue how to, you know, stand up and yell and get excited and not do the dumb wave at the wrong time because we just are there to have fun with our families and stuff and we don't realize we can actually impact the game and help the Packers win, but, you know, we'd rather just go watch, not help, and then go home and complain on Twitter how the Packers didn't do their job. But, but, but external factors are just a part of football. You know, London, what a really dumb thing that is. I mean, I know it's going to make everybody more money, and I do like that there is an audience now in Europe and, and everywhere, and we're trying to expand that, and that's cool. But how unfair is it to have some teams fly all the way to London, especially when you got 
some teams that are used to it, like the Jaguars, and then you got somebody that's, you know, Midwest, West Coast, whatever. That's a really long flight. And how much that impacts you even the next week. You know, when you fly back and you got some jet lag and everything else going on, and you're just kind of beat. It's just not really fair. The Packers kind of have an unfair advantage in that one because they just basically say no. The Packers are just old curmudgeons. It's funny because it's if you look at... Packers are kind of interesting in this way. They hate anything external, right? They, they completely cut everybody out. If you notice, if you ever go to like these rumors websites, there's almost never any rumors about the Packers because they're all very tight-lipped. Not to say that certain people like Ian Rappaport or whatever don't have an in somewhere with somebody. Occasionally, like, I remember I just saw recently somebody predicted uh, that uh, the Ravens guy coming to Green Bay, I think it was seven months ago, because he overheard a guy who overheard a guy who overheard a guy at a bar. Like, occasionally you get that, but you go to, like, Walter Football or any of these places where they, they, they've got, like, a couple, and they're garbage sources, I, I get that, right? It's, like, low-level scouts that aren't the ones actually making the decisions or whatever, but still. There's never any news about the Packers. There's nothing about the Packers. Hard knocks, never going to be the Packers. Flying to London, never going to be the Packers. Anyways, I'm going on tangents off of tangents off of tangents here. But as far as the rules are concerned, external factors, as much as I would love to remove them as much as I possibly can, which the only way to really do that, I, I mean, there, there is no way to do that, really. Maybe if you could find a way to play football virtually, you know? Which, to be honest... I don't know that that won't happen in the future. As a matter of fact, I know what's coming in the future, which is going to be awesome, is um, being at the stadium virtually. It's one of the cool things about this whole 5G thing, with basically no latency or lag or whatever. Everything is like real time, so you can get like VR headsets, and I'm sure they're going to have cameras all over the stadium, and you just pay for a seat, probably have some sideline stuff, like literally like on the sideline, and you can just watch the game at home, at the stadium, at home. Good way to sell basically infinite tickets because there doesn't need to ever be a limit. <laughs> like, you want the sideline ones? That's like 50 bucks. If 10,000 people want that same seat, 10,000 people can have that same seat. But there's always going to be traveling from stadium to stadium. There's going to be weather. There's going to be crowd noise. There's going to be different audiences. There's going to be different number of people. Some stadiums have more capacity than others. Some are more built for sound. Some have annoying horns. Which, I, I'm telling you right now, if the Packers aren't working on some kind of a noise machine, why not? The NFL allows it. Just do it. I don't care what it is. Make it a cow mooing. I, I, I don't care what it is. <laughs> that would be the greatest troll of all time. Like, no, 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 no. This is just a cool thing we do. Trust me. And it's just a really loud mooing sound that just... It's just like a constant <laughs> moo. And whenever the NFL allows you to have it on, you just do it. I don't, I don't know. What else could it be? Cheese doesn't make noise. It could be like polka music, but that's, I mean, that's not like a loud noise. Unless it's like an, a, a constant accordion sound or something, but that's that's dumb. What? what? Uh, yeah, I'm, just do a moo, man. We'd get mocked mercilessly, but guess what? I don't even care because it's going to be loud. It's going to be real loud, as loud as we can possibly make that moo sound. It's not going to be like the air raid where sometimes it's loud and then it kind of goes down. No, 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 no. Constant high pitch. is Well, kind of low pitch, but constant loud. Just saying, man, everybody's cheating. Why can't we cheat? <laughs> or just like that goat yelling. I think we got it. I think that's it. So, anyways, we're going to be talking about the overtime rules. All right, let's get going. Thank you for finally shutting that off over there. My goodness, that is loud and obnoxious. Sorry, just just home things. Which, it's good that I'm not a homeowner, because I refer to things that make noise in my own home as home things. So, probably a good idea for me to be a renter. So I can call somebody else that owns this property and say, hey, this home thing is making weird noises. It's good to know your own strengths and weaknesses, that's all I'm saying. Also, I fix things for a living, so <laughs> that's cool. Where to start? Well, since I'm in sort of a ranty mood talking about, uh, you know, things you can't control and whatnot. Let's talk overtime. Now, my general thought on this is, first of all, I, I don't super care because I understand the arguments on both sides and all that, but I do fall on the side of we should give the other team the opportunity. The biggest argument that I keep hearing, which again annoys me because it's just regurgitating, 
It's not a coincidence that everybody has the exact same argument. It drives me nuts. Form your own opinion, for crying out loud. But the one opinion that everybody seems to share is that you should have to play defense because that's part of playing football. But you know what? I'm going to call, you know, nonsense on that. How about that? The fact of the matter is this is an offensive league. These are mostly offensive teams. And when you have two offensive teams that are most likely going to drive down and score because both teams have better offenses than defenses. And by the way, it's primarily the NFL that built it this way. The NFL created a league in which offense is, is, you know, going to be better than defense. Some teams overcome that and have very good defenses or better defenses than their offenses. But primarily, especially teams that do well in the postseason, teams are better on offense. Meaning, the coin flip, I'm guessing if you were to check and run the numbers, winning a coin flip means winning the game a disproportionate number of times. That's not a coincidence. I mean, if, if it was about 50-50 and somebody started crying, well, we didn't win the coin flip, then fine. You could say, well, hey, look at all these other teams that win when they don't win the coin flip. It's not about the coin flip. It's about playing football. No, but it is about the coin flip, which is why like 90% of the time the team that wins the coin flip is going to win the game. I don't like that. I don't see the big problem with allowing the other team to go get another possession. The only real reason you don't do that, in my mind, is because you got other games coming up and you don't want the game to go on too long. Now, one compelling argument that I understand is the fact that, you know, you had four quarters to get it right, but even that is, so what? At the end of four quarters, they're tied, so now what do we do is the question. We continue playing to find out who, because all of this comes down to which team is the better team. And then at the end of it, if a team wins in overtime because they won the coin flip, we don't know who the better team was. We know that the teams were evenly matched at the end of four quarters, and then one team won the coin flip, and then won the game. That doesn't mean that they were the better team, because we never got a chance to see the, the, the other team get a shot at it. You think the Chiefs weren't going to get a touchdown? Why do you think? Of, of course nobody thinks that. You're just making lame excuses. So I understand needing to find a solution that doesn't allow a game to go on forever, especially in the regular season when you've got games butted up right next to each other, and you want as little overlap as is possible. But, it, it, you know, at, at least come up with a better excuse than that. I mean, if that's all it is, we got another game coming up, we have to end this, then just say that. Don't give me this nonsense about, well, you know, you got to play the first four quarters. It should have never got to this point. Yeah, and if Drew Brees would have got the ball faster, the defender would have never got a shot, you know, a chance to pass interfere. Coulda, woulda, shoulda. Wrong is still wrong. It's still a penalty. It still should have been called. What's your point? The game was decided by a coin flip. That's why every time he goes into overtime and the team you don't want wins the coin flip, you throw your hands up and go, well, there you go. That's the, and it's been that way since forever, even more so in the past when all you needed was a field goal. But if you're looking for fairness, if you're looking for the correct outcome, you have to give the other team the ball. You're creating an overtime in which the coin flip disproportionately tells you who's going to win, which means a coin ultimately decides who wins this game. It's like a team ending in it's it's like a game ending in a tie. There's no satisfactory end to it. Nobody really won. There's there's one team that gets a W and another team that gets an L, which has massive implications especially in the playoff. But again, who is the better team? Don't know. But let me tell you why I think this is a good thing. Let me give you my reasoning behind it. And it's kind of twofold. First of all, I think maybe perhaps my generation in particular is a little too wrapped up in fairness. And I would be the first person to say that. Like, the, you know, this whole diatribe has been about nothing about the NFL is fair. The refs are never going to be fair. The, the stadiums aren't fair. The crowd noise isn't fair. The travel schedule isn't fair. What day of the week you play isn't fair. Having a, you know, a Sunday and then a Thursday, that's not fair. Especially for the traveling team. Weather isn't fair. You know, injuries aren't fair. Even the talent on your team to some degree isn't fair. Nothing's fair, and why should it be? But I think for a lot of us, we just want to remove as many variables as possible and see who's the best. But beyond that, the biggest thing for me is the fact that it is fair insofar as everybody plays by the same rules, meaning everybody understands at the beginning of the season that in the event of overtime, or or even just in, in regular time, defense has to matter. 
Think about Tom Brady in the last two minutes. Nobody wants to go up against that. Aaron Rodgers in the last couple minutes. There are certain teams that you just don't want to face in the last two minutes because your defense probably isn't going to be able to hold up. And the fact of the matter is this happens all the time in the playoffs and otherwise where offenses who win the coin flip end up beating defenses that just can't hold up, especially after more than four quarters. Meaning there's something to be said about teams not just emphasizing offense, 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 offense. If you want to be successful, especially in the postseason, go out and get some defense because think about this. Nobody would have doubted that the Chiefs defense was going to lay an egg. The Chiefs defense is garbage because they're offense, 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 offense. Not to say they're not trying, but the emphasis is offense. Offense is what they get. Defense is nothing. The Patriots, on the other hand, had the coin flip gone the other way. Granted, the Chiefs had done a great job, and they're a great offense. The Patriots can play defense, they can play disciplined defense, and they can play four quarters and then some. That's why they're built for the playoffs. That's why certain teams who have a little more balance are more more ready for the playoffs, because when things like this happen, you're more capable of surviving. When it comes down to, and it does, in the regular season, in the postseason, a lot of these games come down to your defense has to win it. Your offense is on the sideline, right? You're, you're up by two points, and your defense has to keep them from getting a field goal in the last 45 seconds. You're up by four points. You've got to keep them out of the end zone for, for a minute and a half. Teams that don't have defense can't do it. The Green Bay Packers are a team that just can't do it. The Chiefs can't do it. I don't know if the Rams can do it. Most teams these days just don't have defenses that can pull that out. So what I'm saying is, given that everybody has the same information and understanding that you can't just have offense because at some point it's not going to work. At some point your offense can't save you. Your offense is on the sideline and the clock is winding down and it comes down to your defense winning the game or losing the game. You need to have a defense. Beyond that, it creates some balance, but not just balance, it's sort of a security. Think about the fact that how much the NFL and football teams are a team sport. Think about the fact that, let's say Devontae Adams has a bad day. That will devastate the Packers. Why? Because we don't have other wide receivers that can pick up the slack. One of the benefits of having multiple wide receivers isn't just that on on any given day we can just distribute it to to four or five different guys, which is true. It's the fact that if Devontae has a bad day, I got this guy, I have this guy, I have this tight end. We got a running back, we got a running game, we got all these different things that we can rely on because everybody has bad days. Aaron Rodgers has bad days, Adams has bad days. I don't know if Bakhtiari's ever had a bad day, but most people have bad days. By having a broad, you know, swath of talent. You can compensate for certain people having bad days. That's also true of offense and defense, and this is what we've seen with teams like the Chiefs, teams like the Packers, who are all offense. It gets you only so far, and even if, if it doesn't come down to you know defense having to win the game, sometimes your offense just has an off day. If your entire team is, is based on your offense, needs to be just clutch, just has to be playing out of their minds 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, you're not going to win, especially, again, in the playoffs. Because to be able to go that entire time without your offense ever having a hiccup against playoff caliber, Super Bowl caliber teams is unlikely. And at some point, the defense has to pick up the slack. 2010 Packers won the Super Bowl. Defense was there to pick up the slack. Most teams, you'll see that, that actually make it to and win the Super Bowl, have defenses that can pick up the slack when the offense can't quite hang. We saw that with the Eagles. Foles was a freak for the last two games, but prior to that, Foles was kind of garbage. The defense played lights out. And then when the defense started to taper, Foles was there to pick up the slack for the defense. The balance is super important. I think that should be the biggest takeaway from this because, you know what, it's not fair, but it kind of is. Because everybody understands what the situation is. Everybody understands that when you get into play, in, into the overtime, you might lose the coin toss. And if you lose the coin toss, you have to play defense. If you can't play defense, you're going to lose in overtime. And if you think that doesn't matter, go ask the last two games, the last two teams who lost in overtime. Ask them if they wish they had some better defense. Again, it seems minor, but these are the, these are the things that make a difference. These are the and, and how many games throughout the regular season does that matter? How many times did the Packers offense not have it? I mean, it was, it was most of the season, really. 
But there were times when the Packers' offense was close. Where was the defense to pick up the slack? And there were times when the defense looked good. Where was the offense? you got to have the, the, the balance between offense and defense. You have to have that as a team, and it needs to be a priority. And I think, again, the good thing about these kinds of things is it rewards the balance, the teams that, as much as we say offense is all that matters, that's true up to a point. But you see when you get into the playoffs, teams that can't balance it out can't hang in the playoffs. The Patriots have offense and they have defense, and they're consistently successful. You look at the Baltimore Ravens. they got a ton of defense. they got no offense. Offense couldn't go, didn't work. Chiefs have offense, they don't have defense. The Saints seemingly had both. Coulda, woulda, shoulda won the game. I think it was a, a tough one between the Rams and the Saints. But I do think that's an important message going forward. If you, if you are a GM, if you are an owner, if you are a coach, if you are whatever, and you think we're just going to emphasize offense and you know we're, we're just going to try to replicate what the Chiefs do, do it with, with a lot of caution. Yeah, you got to have the quarterback, and, and scoring offenses are important. But defense is unbelievably important through the regular season, but especially in the postseason, because you have to have the balance or you're never going to make it. So in that regard, it's almost a check to itself. As much as the NFL is pushing, 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 offense, 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 it's rules like this that are unfair that are signaling to the league, you can't just do offense. You better get your defense in line. And again, as much as... We want to believe that this is an offensive league. We went through and looked at it not too long ago, where one of the most important things in winning a Super Bowl is a defense, especially scoring defense. Points allowed. You know, quarterback points scored and points allowed are the three biggest factors that I could find. Got to have the defense. And if you don't have a defense, you better have just an absolutely freakish offense. And even that is is tenuous because, again, usually an offense is going to have a bad day. If, if not, then good on you. But even so, you get into a shootout with another team that has a good offense going up against your defense, what's the game plan here? you got to get lucky, I guess. You, you shouldn't have to play football that way. So, anyways, those are my thoughts on overtime. In terms of just true fairness, no, it's not fair. The team that wins the coin toss is going to have a disproportionate you know, win percentage, and that's because this is an offensive league. And again, if it was fair, it would be closer to 50-50. Everybody fully understands that a coin toss, the winner of the coin toss, is disproportionately going to win. But it does have a positive aspect to it. And yes, you probably should have done more in the first four quarters. That's technically true, even though I think that's an incredibly weak argument. And yeah, we got other games coming up. We got to wrap this up somehow. We can't let this go on back and forth forever. Even in the playoffs, I mean, hey, we got our... You know, we got the Patriots game coming up. We need to televise that. We need to wrap this game up here. So, fine. This will be one of those instances where, you know, I hope you built up a defense over the season because they're going to have to win this game for you. Sometimes defense has to win win games for you. I mean, we don't say that in, in with one minute left. You know, like, well, that's not fair. I, you know... I mean, Aaron Rodgers went down the field, and, and, you know, so they took the lead. But guess what? You give me give me another – give our quarterback a minute and a half. We could go down the – no, man, time's up. Sorry. It's really just like adding extra time onto the game. That's really all we're doing. So, anyways, I guess ultimately I'm in favor of the overtime rule for that, for that factor, but the idea that it's fair is nonsense. It's not fair, but I'm okay with it. All right, let's talk uh, Cole Beasley. A lot of hype about Cole Beasley. Everybody loves Cole Beasley. Got to get Cole Beasley. I, I nah. Look, some of the benefits, first of all, Cole Beasley is uh, a lot less injury prone. Randall Cobb has been injured for three years straight. He hasn't played uh, 16 full games since, uh, what was it here? 2015 was the last time he played 16 games. And even then, it was just two years. So if you look at his entire career, 15-15-6, 16-16, 13, 15, 9. He's only played 16 games twice in his career, so a little bit injury prone. Granted, there were three 15s mixed in there, but still, not getting a lot of 16 game seasons out of him. You look at Cole Beasley, it's, you know, he started off the season, well, presumably this isn't necessarily injury related, but starting in 2014, 16, 16, 16, 15, 16. In five years, he's missed one game. So you're getting a lot more consistency out of Cole Beasley, and that's a good thing. If you flip over to Pro Football Focus, I, I don't know. If you were to take the entirety of the career, Randall Cobb is probably a better wide receiver. The big difference here is there seems to be a general slide. Randall Cobb was incredible in 2014, 
above average in 2015, good in 2016, and then average in 2017, average in 2018. Now, injury probably factored into that a little bit, but you can't necessarily say that if he's not injured, then he's better for two reasons. One, you don't know that. And two, why would you assume he's not going to be injured when he's injury prone? So it doesn't make sense to make that a calculation based on whether or not we should keep him. He hasn't been any good since 2016. Now, Cole Beasley, you know, there isn't this general decline, but there's definitely inconsistency. He was good this year. He was average last year, and then he was very good, and then he was average, and then he was above average, and then he was good, and then he was average. So we're getting him on a little bit of a high point. It's his third best year of his career. So I think people with their recency bias see what he did, and they're like, oh, he's really good, and he's better. Eh. I would say that they're similarly talented. Cole Beasley is a year older. He's less injury prone, but he gets less targets, less receptions. I mean, if you look at the stats, I think Randall Cobb is actually a little bit better, but they're actually very, very, very similar. In other words, you're getting very, very similar wide receivers. Now, we could throw out the same caveat we do every single time. Yeah, but it's Aaron Rodgers. But when has that ever really been the case? Let's just be honest about it. Now, granted, we don't really get a ton of free agent wide receivers, so it's hard to say, but we do get free agent tight ends, and it helps zero, right? Guys get a lot worse when they come here at tight end. Why? I thought Aaron Rodgers was supposed to make everybody better. They don't. They all get worse. Not saying it's Aaron Rodgers' fault, but I'm just saying you can't just say, yeah, but Cole Beasley here in this system would be amazing. Why? So for me, I, I, I don't get it. It almost just seems like a slap in the face to Randall Cobb to say we're not going to pay you money, but we're going to go get some other guy who's a year older than you that's about as productive as you, that's about as good as you, and we're going to pay him instead. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, if, 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 it, if it was you have to pick right now Randall Cobb or Cole Beasley, I'd probably pick Cole Beasley. It feels a little safer, but they're just so similar it doesn't make sense you might as well just try to keep Randall Cobb. I mean, if Cole Beasley's good enough, I think Randall Cobb's good enough. Plus, you figure the relationship with Aaron Rodgers, the the familiarity with, well, system's going to change, but relative familiarity with the system, and, and the quarterback at least. We know he's a good locker room guy. He's a good person. He's a good teammate. He's, he's, he's all these things. It just, you know, it, it's 50-50. The slight edge based on, you know, the the potential of Cole Beasley, the fact that he doesn't seem to be in a a general decline, the injury issues. But then, you know, again, you look at Randall Cobb and you got the familiarity aspect of it, the, you know, potential of if he doesn't get hurt, what if kind of stuff. It's just, it's just 50-50 for me. I mean, Cole Beasley is just way too similar to Randall Cobb. He's not an elite wide receiver. He's talented at times. He's very inconsistent. I would think that Randall Cobb would be in that exact same category. And again, Cole Beasley is is 30 years old. He's, you know, a year and a half basically older than Randall Cobb. So I'm I'm not super big on the Cole Beasley thing. I think it's just a lot of people getting hyped up about potential and about this and about that. But I... I don't see anything that tells me Cole Beasley is going to come in here and be a stud. I mean, Cole Beasley's never really been a stud. So what, what's the hype about? I mean, I, I've seen highlight reels, but have you seen Randall Cobb's highlight reels? I, mean, I, I, I just think sometimes Packer fans get bored. We just want new, right? Randall Cobb, we, we've seen it, and he's not what he used to be. Let's get a new guy. And then new, for some reason, for us, just means like he's going to be a freak. And then we just do this thing where it's like, well, well, well Aaron Rodgers, so he's going to be really good. Yeah, I, yeah, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. It, it just seems like a lateral move and a waste of money. If we're going to spend extra dollars on wide receivers, make him a lot better. Make him an upgrade, a definitive upgrade. Otherwise, just draft a guy. Cole Beasley is just... I don't, I don't, no, I'm not into it. It's not my thing. Not a big fan. Um, moving on to Mr. Vic Beasley. Now, just looking at his production, just looking at his, you know, for example, pro football focus score, Vic Beasley is straight trash. Um, he's actually gotten worse just about every single year. If you look at his rookie year, he was technically considered good. If you look at 2016, he was also considered good, but slightly better. 2017, he was below average. 2018, garbage. Horrific tackler, terrible in coverage, really bad in run defense, and below average pass rusher. Now, the only real caveat here is that this is a 4-3 team. 
Uh, Vic Beasley is six foot three, two forty six. This is this is one of those weird situations where why in the world did the Falcons draft him? You're a four three team and he's a three four outside linebacker. Why would you do that? Teams do that all the time and it drives me absolutely out of my mind. How in the world is a six foot three, two hundred and forty six pound guy supposed to play defensive end? I just think he it, it, he's just too small for that. I mean he's he's on the leaner side for an outside linebacker. So we could play the game where we say, you know, he'll come over here as an outside linebacker and he'll reju- will rejuvenate his career. Maybe. And yeah, I mean, if you look at his sack numbers, it's, it's not that bad. So if you're just looking at his sack numbers, um, and then you figure he's miscast, so you take those sack numbers, you make them bigger because he's coming here to be a 3-4 outside linebacker, which is more his, his speed. I mean, he's a first-round draft pick. He's only 26 years old. There's some potential potential there. But he would have to be super cheap, and it would be a very short-term contract. Meaning his, his, um, there would just need to be no. Um, what am I looking for here? No market for him. Um, basically, nobody wants to pay him. Nobody wants to do anything, and we would get him on the cheap for like a one-year contract or something, just kind of like a prove-it deal because his, you know, he's done such a terrible job. But I'm, I'm not paying big money for this guy. He just, he's not proven himself. And again, the sack numbers aren't horrible. At least in 2016, they were very good. They're, they're definitely below where you want them to be. Uh, this is, again, Pro Football Focus kind of does it a little bit different, so I don't know if I trust their sack numbers as much, but it is what it is. They have them at 16 in 2016, 7 in 2017, and 6 in 2018. Now, 6 is it's not good, but for the Packers, it's almost like, oh, I'll take 6. But how much are you willing to pay for 6? And beyond that, again, pass rush is his number one attribute. Horrific in coverage, horrific tackler, terrible run defender. I mean, he's basically like Kyler Fackrell, right? His one thing is like he's kind of flashy at times as a pass rusher, except he's not Kyler Fackrell. So he's less than Kyler Fackrell. And again, maybe you put him as a 3-4 outside linebacker, but there's just nothing here for me to look at and go, yeah, we should get this guy. If you want to take a flyer, fine, but he better be cheap and it better be a short-term contract. And I just tend to think with 32 teams out there, including the Falcons who could retain him. I just can't imagine us offering a, you know, one year, $5 million deal or something is going to be his market. I think somebody's going to offer him more money than that or better contract than that. And I just don't want to. So best of luck to him. Hopefully he does go to a three, four team and can rejuvenate his career. But, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not really super interested in him. I loved him coming out of college. And um, he really was a very good pass rusher. He's definitely a pass rush specialist. And I do think if he goes to 3-4, he could be a good pass rush specialist. But coverage is coverage. Tackling is tackling. Setting an edge is setting an edge. And apparently he can't do those things. So at best, I think you put him as an outside linebacker. You give him a little bit more as a sack guy. But he's strictly a pass rush specialist. And you hope you can squeeze 10 sacks out of him is kind of how I see this. And again, I just don't want to pay a lot for that. And I do think some teams are going to see a, you know, number eight overall pick in 2015. They remember scouting the guy, you know, six foot three, two forty six, uh, ran a fourth five three, twenty six years old. They're going to see the potential. They're going to they're going to get all hyped up the way you know. You know, I I tend to think GMs and and owners and stuff get as as like hyped up as fans do about some stuff. They see the potential and they want to be like brilliant. They want to be seen as the one who saw the potential and, and, and pulled the trigger. And the Packers are always the opposite. You know, they, they usually are like, nah, we're just going to play it safe and play it smart, which means we don't hit on guys like Vic Beasley that end up rejuvenating their career and going off. But we also don't draft or get a bunch of garbage free agents that are garbage and always have been garbage and pay them too much money and get stuck with their contracts. So it's a, it's a no for me for both Beasleys. No Vic Beasley and... Um, no Cole Beasley. Now, the uh, the last question here before we get going is going to be Anthony Barr, and it's actually very similar to Vic Beasley. Not exactly the same, but kind of similar. I think he's overhyped, and I, I say this every time I talk about the Vikings. Their, their linebackers are not as good as everybody builds them up to be. He had a good year in 2018. He had an average year in 2017. He had a terrible year in 2016. But regardless of any of that, it doesn't matter because what we're talking about is taking a guy who the Vikings miscast. They drafted, with the ninth overall pick, a very good pass rusher and made him an off-ball linebacker. 
Now, I mean, kudos to you for not trying to make him a defensive end, but I almost think he'd be better off as a defensive end because at least give him a shot to be a pass rusher. If it can pan out great, why do you take with, with I mean, it costs you so much with the ninth overall pick. You take a guy that's a good value at the ninth overall pick, but you make him play a position he doesn't play. And then if, if you look at his, his grades on Pro Football Focus, for example, his number one attribute for, for the entirety of his career has been pass rushing. So even as an off-ball linebacker, even though he doesn't get a ton of pass rush, I mean, he, he does probably for compared to most outside linebackers, he gets to rush from the inside. But that's one of the things he does best. So, I mean, the, the biggest thing here is I, I don't know how you can have such a definitive position on we need to get him. There's a lot of questions here. We don't know how good of an outside linebacker he can be because he hasn't been one. Not a not a 3-4 outside linebacker, not a pass rusher, an edge rusher. I mean, he, he's played 99 snaps at the defensive line spot. Uh, you know, it, occasionally... So 53 snaps as a left outside linebacker, 44 snaps as a right outside linebacker. And and what I'm referring to there is an on-the-line pass-rushing outside linebacker, a 3-4 outside linebacker. He's done about a little under 100 snaps this past season. 646 snaps from the inside, inside the box. He's had 54 snaps at corner, 10 snaps at safety, 67 snaps on special teams. So he's, he's used all over the place. But this guy is an inside-the-box linebacker. Now, I suppose these there, there's enough here to look at, especially over the course of his career. Look at him when he played outside linebacker and see what he's done. Maybe some people who have super strong opinions are looking at that and have seen that he's a stud, and maybe that's part of why they're making their determination. But I've never seen anybody throw that up on, uh, on Twitter. I've never seen anybody talk about when he does that for the Vikings. He's very effective. All they talk about is how good he was at UCLA. So what? We're talking about 2013. So so really, and again, yeah, I'll take a flyer on Anthony Barr, and I'll take him way before I would take Vic Beasley because of the massive upside that he has. But we got to talk about compensation. I'm not even going to d- discuss Anthony Barr until we talk compensation because if he's talking about wanting to be considered a premium pass rusher, having never played 3-4 outside linebacker in his basically in his career, you're dreaming, man. And again, I don't know how much the hype train is going to be. It's, it's, forget Aaron Rodgers. Forget that whole situation. How much are you willing to pay for a guy that we have no idea if he can play the position effectively? Now, he could be an absolute stud and he could be a steal, but I tend to think that that ability and that potential is going to drive his price up. Are you willing to give him a three-year or four-year, $12, $13, 15000000 million contract I mean, per year? You want to have two Nick Perrys on this team? I don't. And again, I you know the the smart thing to do maybe you give him a big one year contract. You know it's it's big enough and it's a prove it deal for Anthony Barr, and maybe that would be the best for everybody. But I, I feel like everybody would understand that and try to offer him one. But the I mean, the, the crazy thing is, the guy's getting paid twelve million dollars this year. That's uh, presumably because the Vikings just pushed out a ton of money. But this past year, he made $12 million. Now, that's not to say he has to get $12 million again. He, you know, the market is what it is. And actually, that was all base salary. So no, that had nothing to do with it. But I don't think he wants to go back. So would you do a one-year $15 million prove-it deal? Because I, I, I tend to think Anthony Barr would. If he's going to bet on himself and say, I, if, if you put me in the right system, make me a 3-4 outside linebacker, especially on a, you know, presumably he'd want to go to a good team. So Packers maybe not his top choice. You know, go to a stout team that has another really good outside linebacker on the other side that I can play off of. I'll be the number two. I'll get 12 sacks, and then the next year I'll get a $20 million contract or something ridiculous because everyone will think that I'm just some hidden gem somewhere. But I, I tend to think that makes sense. The question is compensation. How much are you going to pay this guy who has, you know, th- there's not a lot to go on. And, and yeah, I'm sure the, the teams can look at what he's done with the Vikings and look at when he's doing, when he's along the defensive line and and check out how good of a player he is and base it off of that. But I guess what I'm saying is I don't I don't know from my perspective that I can really give an opinion on whether or not I want him because I haven't done that work. And I don't know how anybody else who hasn't done that, and I don't care what he did at UCLA. I want to know what he did for the Minnesota Vikings. I want to know what he did as a professional in the NFL. When he lines up on the defensive line as a pass rusher, rusher whether it's defensive end or outside linebacker, how does he perform? So I'm I'm, I'm not closing the door on it. 
And I do think there's maybe a little something to the Anthony Barr and Aaron Rodgers thing. Just because, again, I'm, 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 as if you've been listening, very protective of this locker room environment. If you listen to, like, what Devontae Adams, and that, this is something else, I'm really out of time. Maybe I'll play the clip tomorrow. But, um, you know, Devontae Adams was interviewed. Uh, Kelly Price is her name. She was out uh, down in Florida for the, for the Pro Bowl and interviewed Devontae, and he said he had a chance to talk with the coach and, and just – Really talked about how impressed he was with him, how likable he is, how relatable he is. He likes that he's young, which I mentioned that. And it felt like a ridiculous thing to say, but, you know, you, you kind of have this common understanding and this common energy. It's not like, you know, dad and son relationship. It's like a peer relationship. And Devante seemed to want to echo that, talking about how relatable he is. And, and you, you know, again, look at look at Sean McVay and the way that they interact and how this is, I mean, this is... <laughs> It's like a massive frat, right? It's just guys like sell it. The coach is like jumping up and down and celebrating with guys. He's getting all fired up. I saw a video that just yesterday he has a guy, I don't know what his actual job is, but he follows him around and like pulls him out of the way. Like when the refs come and he grabs his waist and pulls him to the side and like pulls him off the field and stuff because Sean McVay is just so like laser focused and just running around like a crazy person. He literally has somebody dedicated to making sure he doesn't run into people or run on the field because he's just, he has no idea where he is in time and space. But you've seen that. And I'm not saying Lafleur is going to act that way, but that's a good environment. You want to just have this like this family feel like this is us. We're going to do it together. We're going to do all this stuff. And if you've got any kind of negative tension, you know, I mean, let's not forget this ended with somebody getting flipped off. It's it's a relatively big thing. And Anthony Barr and Aaron Rodgers are going to have to be able to bury the hatchet and not just like begrudgingly bury the hatchet. Like, you know, yeah, 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 whatever. Let's go win some football games, whatnot. This this team has to 100% be in unison and we've got to protect the locker room. And if there's even a, a hint that Anthony Barr who we want to be somewhat of a leader on defense, we're looking at being our number one pass rusher, which is probably the most important guy in our defense, is having a conflict with the most important guy in our offense, and you're telling me I'm not supposed to take that seriously or I'm overreacting to the fact that that might be a conflict? I don't think so. No. Not when we have a rookie coach trying to come in and unify the locker room. Our number one pass rusher and our number one guy on offense, our leader of our team, our quarterback, have a, have a, a negative history and don't like each other. And you've just got this tension in the air. You can't have that stuff. And I don't care how petty you think it is. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't care. I'm not going to risk that. I'm not, I'm not having that in the locker room. So anyways, I never got a chance to get to the Senior Bowl. Uh, I did enough ranting, and I really do have to get going. Maybe we'll talk Senior Bowl tomorrow. Um, it'll give me a little bit more time and another day of information um, to be able to acquire some some more thoughts and uh, that kind of stuff. Otherwise, you folks have yourselves a fantastic Thursday. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.